Throughout our period of government, we have also pursued a relentless focus on jobs, with 700,000 jobs created in Australia in the last four years. In last year's budget, we delivered reforms to help more Australians into work through better support and a clearer shaping of their responsibilities. And we have pursued improved frontline services for Australians, including better hospitals and now a new national disability insurance scheme. We have done all of this because I will never endorse the perspective that Australians are too greedy or view themselves as entitled to too much and that we should be content to see frontline services slashed to the worst levels available in other countries in our region. Our vision for our nation is not about this race to the bottom. Rather, it is all about improving the lives of Australians today as Australia is ready to succeed through this century. There are really good reasons for optimism about our ability to do this. In part, that optimism should come from Australia's endowment as we grapple with this challenge. This endowment is much more than our natural endowment. It includes what we have built together since the Hawke and Keating era and through that era, the open economy and strong economic institutions which form so much of our endowment today. The white paper process is about guiding us to seize the opportunities that are now opening up, recognising this endowment. But we need to be aware that other countries are competing for the same opportunities that we are striving for. And Asian economies themselves continue to move up the value chain, developing new capabilities of their own. Asia has recently overtaken Europe in the share of world R&D it performs. In 1998, China performed twice as much research and development as Australia. In 2008, it performed six times as much. Four of the five top performing school systems are located in our region, not in America or Europe, and ours is not amongst them. And we know all too well that painful structural change is occurring in the Australian economy, and that is creating strain in some parts of our nation. Australian businesses must find opportunities in conditions where the dollar and terms of trade will remain high for the foreseeable future. And they will not be able to do that by simply doing more of the same or by slashing costs and quality. They will need to offer products and services with distinctive value based on real areas of competitive advantage. Indeed, the 21st century business model is likely to be very different from the successful business models of the last quarter of the 20th century. In some cases, Australian businesses will be able to access large Asian markets through export, including through regional supply chains. In others, the business opportunities will be secured by establishing enterprises, including business partnerships, in Asian countries. Already some firms are showing how these things might be done. Just weeks ago, we saw the venerable Australian law firm Mallison's merge with a Chinese peer, King and Wood, to create a new legal powerhouse centred in Asia. It is the first alliance of its type in the world, combining a Chinese and Western law firm that will operate across mainland China, Hong Kong and Australia. A few weeks later, GM Holden, here in Australia, struck an agreement to design and engineer two new car models for manufacture in China by Shanghai GM, a joint venture with the government-owned Shanghai Automotive Industry Group. These developments that were rare 10 years ago are still unusual today, but in the decade to come, they need to be absolutely routine. How we achieve that is what the white paper is all about. So let me refer to two areas where I hope you will be able to play a part in shaping our thinking through your discussions tomorrow as the white paper is prepared. First, Australia's potential to become a regional food superpower. 
Just as we have become a minerals and energy giant, Australia can be a great provider of reliable, high quality food to meet Asia's growing needs. In doing this, we are not just an exporter of commodities, but a partner in growing international markets and a provider of higher valued products and services for the global food industry. Jo Ludwig, our Minister for Agriculture, is developing a national food plan. And I know the Global Foundation has been working to support this process, and I welcome further dialogue on how Australia can best take these opportunities forward. At the same time, Craig Emerson, our Trade Minister, is working hard in his portfolio to develop new agricultural partnerships between Australia and China. As I've said, it's not just about more exports, it's about developing the systems and services that add extra value to them and participating in the development of a market-based solution to food security across the region. Building our food processing industry so that it can supply Asia's growing consumer markets and developing the research, technologies and logistics that strengthen irrigation, grow higher yield crops and improve safety. Second, the white paper consultation has demonstrated that cultural lit literacy and an understanding of what Ken Henry would describe as Asia-relevant capabilities are vital to Australia's prospects of success in this century. When I last visited South Korea in March, I met a young Australian woman who is studying at Yonsei University in Seoul. She had described that it was a great way to prepare for the career she hoped to have in Australian diplomacy. Well, I think she's got that right. We need to encourage more Australians to study and work in the region and maintain their connections over a lifetime. Australia already possesses great specialist expertise in Asian culture, history and geography through our universities and our leading firms. And we have a dazzling array of Asian-Australian communities living here with many different linkages across our region. We must broaden and deepen these Asia-relevant capabilities across the whole of Australian society. We also have an incredible network of Australians living and working in the countries of the region. As the internet and new digital technologies accelerate, we should be using them to gain even more value from this diaspora. Finally, in all of this, we do not forget that every nation approaches this century from the perspective of their own interests and values. Australia is no different. Our commitments to peace and prosperity and our alliance with the US act as a bedrock of our security and our region's security. And as we progress our agenda for engagement and collaboration, we remain clear about the essential importance of Australia's military capability and alliances in this century. Just as important is our continued commitment to building strong partnerships and friendships with other nations of this region. We will maintain an Australian Defence Force able to protect our interests and help maintain the peace and stability of our region. We will also continue to review and update our own capabilities. That's why I announced earlier today that we are bringing forward the next Defence White Paper to early 2013 and that we are taking the next steps in the submarine program. Friends, we can and we should face the Asian century with confidence optimism and strength. We are plotting our path to success. But success never flows easily. It depends on making the right decisions now. As Prime Minister, I remain determined to make us a nation that works together to put ourselves in the position to succeed. A nation able to realise the opportunities that lie in front of us. I thank you very much for your attendance this evening but most particularly over what you will do during your discussions in the days to follow. I thank you for your preparedness to join me in designing and detailing how we can achieve strength and prosperity for our nation in this Asian century.
Thank you very much.